co-innovating for circular solutions. That's the topic of the day, day's talk, but it's also the topic of the, of the position that I'm taking forward. And you can think about these kind of titles as something, as kind of outcome of universities wanting and needing to take a more active role in the society. So giving a social impact in their own environments and, and participating in solving something that we call grand challenges. So it's kind of like a thing that is happening in the university. But for me, these words are also very kind of meaningful in a sense of that they reflect on what I have been doing in the past 20 years and what I hope and aim to be doing in the future in this new position. And in, for those reasons, uh, I think the title is important. I'm going to today spend a couple of minutes on thinking just on few important words on that title. And then I'm going to give two examples what I think is practicing co-innovation for circular solutions. So about the title. Circular solutions there at the end. For me, that refers and that reminds of the fact that our current well being is clearly based on linear processes where we extract, use, and dispose materials at rate and at levels that are clearly not sustainable. That's obvious. We have radical changes in, for, in front of us, and that's the challenge then to think forward, think about possible solutions think them in a way that are inclusive and bring about fairness also in the society. So solutions is also an important word. However, I don't think that sustainability is a puzzle. It's not something that is missing the last piece. It's not going to be done at any point. So solution is not to be thought of as a singular. So we clearly are, we have a job of solving things. We have a job of what I think kind of recognizing, facing, and addressing these important issues. So turning ourselves, our attention towards those problems and caring about them, and thereby solving them gradually, piece by piece, with never-ending process. Then the most important word in the title is the little, little prefix, co. So this is now very fashionable to throw in co at whatever instances. And I'm not blaming my colleagues at the Department of Design who talk about co-design and co-creation, because it is very important in there. And I think that this is really the, the key of the whole tit the title, the prefix co. Co-design in design refers to processes whereby we actively recognize that, that designers need to open up the process and recognize that there are other stakeholders, so including the end users who are there to use the products and services, is part of CO. My colleagues at the Department of Management Studies talk about co-organizing. Again, simple little prefix CO, but it means that you are actively alert and know that your, your work has stakeholders that you need to be uh, addressing and bringing into the processes. On everyday life uh, realms, we talk about co-housing and co-living. So now we are recognizing that the prefix co is used for bringing together a multiple uh, set of actors or different actors. So multiplicity and difference is inside co. But there are still other co-words that are important. That's co-existence and co-habitation that are used, coexistence refers to peaceful being together. So it's not only that we are many and that we are different, but we have to be actively working towards keeping peace and, and cohabiting something that, that, that we share. So at the end, co-scholarship is something that I'm so, so keen on joining and practicing myself. I, I think Aalto is good at that. We have a lot of co in the university, but it just needs to be recognized that that's like an, also an ethical commitment that we do co-innovation, co co co-design, and so on and so forth. That's the tall order, how to do that, how to, how to, how to practice this, how to, how to get your, your kind of 
your sensibilities out in order to do this. And I'm going to share two examples. So first one. Uh, this is about climate change mitigation. So uh, we have a gray history behind us. A lot of carbon dioxide emission emitted through fossil fuels, fuel use. We have a brown future in fr front of us. That's the fact that we cannot phase out fossil fuels fast enough. There's a lot of emissions still coming. And then we have a green future in, uh, in front of us. And that requires our active engagement of humans in order to draw down atmospheric carbon quickly enough and, and in ways that create uh, uh, stable uh, forms of carbon. And one of the examples there uh, on the right-hand side corner is a petri dish with uh, uh, wood chips and biochar. Biochar comes out of a process of pyrolysis of using or, or burning things, burning organic matter with less oxygen so that we don't burn the, all, all the carbon, but we get a stable form of carbon that can be then put into soils, for example, to increase soil health and plant growth. So we have a double dividend on the right-hand side corner. And it's important to have double dividends because other options for the green uh, green area include for something like, uh, uh, for example, bioenergy combined with carbon capture and storage. There we have uh, liquid CO2 that we get, and that's a material that needs to be kept on high pressure. So you need to pump it and you need to ship it internationally. You need to pump it into the deep ocean beds in order to have enough pressure. So that's a highly difficult material and very specialized high-tech solution. Biochar is something that it's much more distributed. So we can see, for example, local heat networks in Finland that are using wood chips. They are going to be producing biochar as well. We have a lot of constituencies of this kind of process. And the technologies look very different when you start to recognize that, that we have social actors that can be involved across the society. And then the, lo the lower image is a process where I've been involved with the city of Helsinki, thinking of how are we going to achieve the green, what are we going to do in the green area? How to achieve that we have carbon drawdown in the city borders using biochar in the city borders. And this is now a very thriving area with Helsinki being internationally recognized leading cities. And for me and for us, it's now looking something like this. So we actually have built a demonstration area in Yatkasari. We have planted 60 trees with different biochar soil products, and it's proving right by the first uh, results. So we have not only put the carbon down to the, to the soil, but we have increased uh, uh, tree growth and, and soil productivity in there. And uh, this is an example of not only do we have in the process included local residen residential uh, associations, uh, civil servants from different departments of the city, HSY, HSY as, the, as the waste uh, managing uh, uh, sector in Helsinki, uh, researchers of different kind. But now we have put the experiment and the technology into the middle of, the, of a residential area. So this is about co-design and co-innovation, also in the sense of being public about it. Then my other example comes from a quite a different uh, direction. And it's also a different way of, of co-scholarship. So now I'm not talking about a process where tangible people and participants would have been involved, but I'm more talking about the, the traditional academic process of trying to develop concepts for recognizing the interests and the needs of different uh, stakeholders. Trying to think forward, trying to think about circular solutions on a conceptual level. They are then always they are solutions and they are consequences at the same time. So every solution that we imagine or develop through technology development needs to be coupled with the social thinking process of what are the consequences. So here, sharing economy, and uh, that's a typical way of thinking about circular economy. We need to share our resources. Uh, we need to do 
uh, more benefit or get more benefit out of less resources. And prime example, infrastructures like the road network and the electricity grid, they are shared resources that our normal life depends on and we share them. They are investments that enable social synchronization. So only through uh, the capacity of the transport network, is it possible that people come to the city and start working at the same time? Their capacity is limited and they get congested. So here we have a question of how much do we invest in the fact that people are able to live their lives in synchronous with others. If we want a, a very, very synchronous uh, society, if we are to start work at 8 o'clock, if, if we are to have our sauna at particular time and so on and so forth, we need a lot of infrastructure capacity. Circular economy or circular solutions really question this and they are, that's, that's kind of one of the, the outcomes. So sharing resources, not only infrastructures, but a lot of resources, uh, requires free timing of everyday activities. We have to re rethink the scheduling of our collective life. And then the question is that who gets prime time access? Who gets to consume the, 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 the services of the infrastructures when they are most needed, when they are most valuable? What happens at what I call the shadow, so that's the idling infrastructure, when there's not that much demand, but the infrastructure is there. This is all the more, more pressing because we have both the need and then we have the techniques of doing this free timing of activity. Dynamic pricing refers to the, to the techniques of making the service uh, cost or the price of the service different based on when you consume. So now we know, of course, electricity. This is very obvious. It changes when we, when we uh, or it matters when we consume. So pr diamond pricing is a market me mechanism to allocate consumption opportunities and coupled with our resource crisis. We have the techniques and the crisis. So this kind of reshuffling of everyday life is going to be important in the future. And how I think about the consequences. This is now a very, very uh, drafty drawing of my thinking. I think visually I've, I, I have used uh, a, the, the, a kind of like an optic metaphor to think about this. So congestion is a bottleneck. At the bottleneck, you have the optic phenomena of, of my consumption turning ahead uh, around. So my consumption is someone else's not consumption. So me consuming is away from someone else's consuming if, if we are uh, in a bottleneck. So that's rhythm's transposition as a concept. Second concept, rhythm's dispersion. So me starting early work, someone else starting very late work will enable more efficient use of the, the infrastructure. So we have a gradual uh, dispersion of our rhythms. Rhythmic dislocation, third uh, notion. Dislo dislocation in Finnish means nyrjähdys. So these kind of uh, everyday changes may be something that jeopardize or compromise your, your functionality in the society. So you may be kind of dysfunctional through the, the rhythms change that is forced by dynamic pricing. And finally, looking from a distance, we have something of shift consumption. So think about shift work, morning, evening, night. We have the same kind of shift consumption in head of us when we go towards uh, resource efficiency. Again, it's like the question of what happens at the shadow. So lastly, long-term consequences of rhythms dispersion. And this is now the co-prefix. That's my commitment on thinking about the future in terms of ethical concern about the possible co consequences. Shadow rhythms, I already talked about that. What happens at nighttime? What is it to, to live the life uh, using the infrastructures when they are idling, when there are not that many people in there. One option is segregation, not, over, over, not only over space. So it's not so that ethnic groups, for example, live at different parts of the city, but ethnic groups can also live different rhythms. So we can have segregation of the society by not meeting each other because of differentiated rhythms. But I want to end this presentation with a more optimistic thought that I think that there are, there's a possibility of cultural formations around idling infrastructures. So the image for early morning Kalasatama 
there is for me a kind of very beautiful moment when the city is empty and it's somehow just waking up. And I like that, that those moments so much. And I think that also this kind of a rhythms change and the shadow, even the shadows can contribute to identities, uh, uh, new identities and new, new, new cultures, which would comply, be compliant with resource efficiency, our needs to, to, to innovate uh, for circular solutions. So with these words, I want to thank you for your attention and wish a nice evening uh, for everyone after all the six presentations. <laughs>